Good evening and welcome to our home. Now, uh, I have to explain what is going on here and why we are here. A uh, couple of weeks ago, we finished our recording of the second co uh, concert of the Blue Candlelight Music Series. And we decided to accompany our concert with a kind of pre-concert talk. And uh, it turns out that it just uh, uh, took a form of conversation. And uh, the idea to continue our conversation belongs to our dear friend Sasha. Thank you very much because it is a wonderful idea. And uh, this is our first attempt to start our new, maybe it will turn into the series of um, kind of mini series of Blue Candlelight series conversations about music. Absolutely not limited, and we decided to uh, pick our first topic today. We will talk about Branislav uh, Huberman, uh, who was a great violinist, and um, I just I, I would love yeah, here to start uh, this topic. Maybe we will start with the, this amazing history and story uh, of uh, Huberman as a, as, a, as, a, as a citizen, and then we'll go and discuss mm -hmm. him as a violinist. So the story of Huberman is to me, much bigger than the story of violinists or music. It's a human story. And he is, I think, historically speaking, infinitely more important for rescuing peoples from Nazis and, and also from pretty much predicting it before any politician outside the Nazis knew it was coming. Um, and we'll talk about that. But um, let's start with his violin history, which is incredible in its own right. He was born in 1882. Who was alive then? Brahms, Tchaikovsky, Dvorak. It was, I'd say, probably the height, and certainly Strauss and, and Wagner too, probably the height of the late Romantic movement, where, you know, if you were a young man in Poland, which is who we're talking about, you were going to hear some unbelievable music with some unbelievable players. Um, so he was born in what is now known as Poland and, you know, somebody like Pinka Zuckerman, for example, his parents are of Polish origin. And so at the time, it seems like the Polish violinists and really the string playing of Poland is what we know the Czech playing is today. I mean, you pretty much, you were going to play a violin and you were going to do it well. Um, and he was quite a prodigy. He started with a local teacher, but he was such a prodigy. And this is really great, actually, for us to talk about now. We think the wunderkinds, right? I mean, today, I mean, all these see YouTube videos of kids playing at the age of five and you know when the Suzuki method got started which is unbelievable a three-year-old could play Paganini this guy went to study with Joachim at the age of ten mm -hmm. now Joseph Joachim who was pretty much the big older brother if you will to Brahms didn't just take on students because he had the Joachim Quartet he was possibly the most famous and certainly one of the most important violinists and, and soloists of, of Europe at the time he took on young Bronislav Huberman, and he took him on because he had a unique approach to the instrument, and that was at the age of 10. So just to emphasize, we're not talking about somebody who can play the violin or who could play with someone. Nothing basic here. This was a talent that needed to be developed rather than made and taught. It needed to be nurtured. And at the age of 14, Johannes Brahms, an elderly bro Johannes Brahms was told, you know, that there's this prodigy and he'd like to invite you to his performance of the Brahms Violin Concerto, which was Joachim's, you know, he premiered it. Joachim, his teacher, was this was his baby. He probably, you would think he would play. No, the 14 year old should play. And Brahms said, I'm not interested. I hate prodigies. I hate, I hate the idea of prodigies. They don't know anything about music. They need to grow up. They talked him into it, and Brahms was in tears from 14-year-old kid, Huberman. And this is the kind of talent we're talking about. We're talking about the kind of talent that, like they said about Yosef Hasid, comes once every couple of hundred years. <laughs> so we're not just talking about somebody you know, who's important enough and, and talented enough to play. We don't have a lot of them, but we have them. This is special. But even more, Brahms said, this is how my concerto is to be played. Yeah, can you to 14 that? years old. Uh, Student <laughs> <was> <laughs> <walking>. <laughs> yeah. So they kind of told it like it was. Yeah. Um, 
Skip to 1933, where he played in the trio with Brahms and our good friend <laughs> Arthur Schnabel. Um, again, you know, somebody who was a young man, much younger than the other two, they took him on as a colleague. Um, in fact, they played piano quartets with one Hindemith before Hindemith came to California. Um, and later that year, Huberman learned about the rise of Nazism. This is later in 33 or 34. And the first thing, well, I don't want to say it's the first thing, but the first important thing that we know about this is he went out and, and declined Fort Wangler's invitation to play with the Berlin Philharmonic. Now, just to put that in context, the Berlin Philharmonic, the vaunted Berlin Philharmonic, certainly was one of the very great in Europe. And I think it's fair to say that, well, we had great orchestras in the 30s and the 40s, like the Cleveland and Chicago. Um, certainly this Berlin sound was quite unique. And to decline that invitation, which entailed pretty much, he didn't make a phone call. You had to write a letter. A letter to Fort Wagner says, thanks, but no thanks. Took a lot of courage. Huberman said, look, there's just no way with what's going on. Because you would have a dictatorial uh, state. I'm not well, going to do that. He said, he said yeah, yeah. The, the, the content of it was, I'm not really sure where this is going to end. Mm. I'm not going to participate in the while it's beginning. And then in 36, he writes an open letter that was published by the Manchester Guardian. That was to the German intelligentsia, the intellectuals that said, look, we're, we're organizing the Palestine Philharmonic and I'm going to save as many Jews of various origins, but starting with Germany, because it's not going to end well. And that first concert, after they actually did this, which is a long story, I'm going to put a link at the bottom mm -hmm. if people want to see the film that was made yes, uh, about it. Yes, I just wanted to ask you, it's a movie, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, the film um, is, is a, yes, it's a yes, feature yes. film. Fantastic. Very beautiful and has some of our friends uh, speaking about it as well. Um, it's worth watching. What's uh, the name of the movie? Orchestra of the Exiles. Oh, Exiles yeah. oh, Orchestra of the Exiles, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you oh, can get it on... The link, uh, we'll put the link at the bottom and then it's also on Amazon Prime if I'm not mistaken. But it's, it's just a sensational film um, and it, it's, it, it's the incredible thing about the Palestine mm -hmm. Philharmonic which became the Israel Philharmonic. But how many people can you say personally 900, over 900 people, because not only the orchestra players, almost anyone who asked him, and naturally their relatives, who are offspring of them is still alive and plays in the same orchestra. Uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what he did for the musical world long after his death. And, and the thing that's even more unbelievable is today, almost 100 years later, yeah many of the members of that orchestra are direct descendants mm -hmm. yeah. of the people he saved. In fact, there are a couple of wonderful essays, I might put those links there mm -hmm. too if, you, if you're okay with it, um, that tell their stories about how their parents and grandparents were saved by Huberman and what it took for him, because you know his career was severely mm -hmm. hampered by saying no to Fort Bungle. And he did play in the States, of course, and, yeah. and he played in Europe, but you know, when you say no to Berlin, um, you're kind of persona non grata for at least a short while, and at the time, then the war came. So it was very difficult. Let's talk about his violins, because one of the most famous things about his instrument is the Gibson, or Hubermann um, Strad, which Joshua was... Bell was Joshua yeah, Bell now plays it, yeah, it's the so-called red violin. Um, but it was stolen from Hubermann's dressing room while he was playing a recital in Carnegie Hall in 1936. And it disappeared for about 50 years, actually, until Charles Beer identified it sight on scene in 1987. Do we know the person? Who we do. His name is Altman. I don't Altman. want to say anything bad of, of the dead, but suffice it to say that he was a bit of a goner. <laughs> And as such, he decided that, well, for 20 bucks, he could sneak in there, play the fiddle. Interestingly enough, he played the fiddle. He, he, you know, even back in the day, yeah. it was worth a lot of money, yeah. not the millions of dollars it is right. today, but worth Played Th it for gigs, played it for the hero. I think $30,000, which was yeah, an enormous amount of money at that time. Paid for that, right. yeah. He played this in Russian Tirum. He played in the Russian Tirum. Is it true he was just covering uh, it with this, uh, some kind I, of... It wasn't uh, him. I think it was... Uh, uh, someone else. Yeah, they, they had oil lamps yeah. and they had candlelight. And so the wax and all of the dirt that you get from burning stuff, you know, 
covered the varnish for 50 years. It was not in great shape, but, <laughs> and not to get into the Strad talk, but I mean, there's something about the genius of Stradivari and how he mixed the varnish. They were able to clean that up. It looks like it's an investor. Yeah. Yeah. In 87, um, it was identified. And if I'm not mistaken, Josh bought it, I think in 96 or seven, something like that. And he's had it since. So um, it, it, it is an incredible story. Um, it's worth mentioning that Hubermont, as a young man, had a strat to play. He had a donor long before it was popular to have donors. He had a donor, I think, all the way from the age of like 13, 14. He had a beautiful strat to play. I think it was 1673, um, an early strat. And then he owned, um, you know, the Gibson strat. Also, what, what people say, well, what, what was he playing in Carnegie Hall when this thing was yeah. taking place? He played the Gibson Del Jesu. And, the, and it's the same Gibson. It's of English violin. His name is George Alfred Gibson. And he owned, if I'm not mistaken, at least four strats. And one of them, I believe, is a cello. Um, and interestingly enough, I mean, the Hills had a great collection, obviously, because they restored these instruments. But this George Alfred Gibson um, is known in history not for his violin playing. I'm sorry, I, unless it's incredible, I'm not aware of his playing. But he's historically important because of these instruments. So um, just to go back uh, to to Hubermann, you know, his vision was far beyond that of an artist. It was a humanitarian vision. It's actually, if I may, of it, uh, because what happens to him. It was the way he was made, because very often he wrote and lectured even during the concerts after the, sec after the First World War on necessity of creating United States of Europe. Mm -hmm. So the Federation of European Country in order to stop this uh, madness. So it's not just a located incident with Israel Philharmonic and things like this. The high humanitarian ideas followed him mm -hmm. uh, pretty much all, all his life. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. That's the way he was made. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think back in the day, and we've talked about yeah. an, an, a different subject, that, you know, the, the great Russians, the Kuchka Magucha, Kuchka, yeah. the, the great five, you know, now we sort of say, well, they weren't necessarily serious musicians because yeah. they were chemists <clears throat> and soldiers. And they, but starting with the Greeks, I mean, the classical education was not optional yeah. or even desired it was absolutely mandatory yeah so somebody like Huberman if he went to the gymnasium or whatever he would learn Aristotle he would learn about mathematics he would learn about geography it wasn't enough you know to play flesh scales it wasn't enough to play the Viotti concertos it was played it was taught but it was just part of a greater whole that if okay. you were thinking or more importantly if you had the talent the whole culture of humanity, a yes. Great musician. Yeah, it into was incumbent upon you to know about life. Yes, absolutely. You know, I just want to quickly uh, say something. I mean, I, I assembled something. Uh, why would you think someone give um, Huberman uh, such violin, such yep. expensive violin? Well, uh, let's just a little bit run through. Age seven plays in Warsaw the Spors Concerto with a great success. Uh, then goes and studies with Joachim and some of his students. 11 years old, appears with a raving success in Belgium and Holland. At 12, Paris and London, London, raving success. 1894, plays Mendelssohn Concerto at Queen Hall, where great, already older star, Adelina Patti, hears him and says, would you play at my for farewell concert in Austria? Then at age 14, plays for Brahms, okay? Uh, he got this violin because he was a unique, uh, a unique personality on the violin. I'm so glad you used the word unique personality because I think one of the things we'll do when we listen to the excerpts we have of his art is the personality and imagination is what separated him from the other great violinists and I would say was essential to make it to the major stage. Yeah. So, for example, when we think of the great violin, let's think, talk about Joachim, and let's talk about Viotti, and, and let's talk before them, Vuitton, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, Isaiah at the time that he lived. Nobody would confuse them, blindfolded, nobody. Yeah. And by the way, it wouldn't take long. Mm -hmm. I'm talking four notes, 
So their personalities were detectable when they played. Not only detectable, but essential. They wouldn't have gotten to where they've got if yeah. they were not the imagination and not the personality that we know them to be. Where would they be? Just hypothetically. They would be a provincial soloist. So basically the career would be, well, you're a nice Polish violinist, went to study with Joachim. Joachim, you know, he's Hungarian, very nice. Well, you know, here's your radius. Play maybe Vienna once every five years. I mean, let you play the smaller towns because, you know, people need music. Um, you want to come to Berlin? Eh, not, not that interested. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, it was very uh, nice. You mentioned the unique personality and it was detectable, you said, right? So can you explain to it, maybe to students how it's possible, um, this detection of the personality, you said it's, it was unmistakable, uh, four notes, five notes. Can we talk about this a little bit and uh, just uh, explain? I, I, I hesitate to give broad um, characteristics. Mm -hmm. I say we listen a little bit, okay. and then I can point out certain things, and maybe we listen again. Mm -hmm. And see if you guys disagree. Mm -hmm. All right, let's listen to a little Tchaikovsky concerto okay. with one William Steinberg, one of my favorite conductors, because yes. he made many recordings with, with the, one of the maybe three people that were my heroes when I was growing up. One of them um, is Nathan Milstein mm -hmm. and Steinberg in the Pittsburgh Symphony. Yeah. One of our old friends um, made, I think, with Milstein at least 12, I mean, watershed recordings. Mm -hmm. And they were doing recordings probably once a month. I mean, that's just what you did for the radio and stuff like that. So Tchaikovsky shared it with William Steinberg and the Berlin State Opera Orchestra. You see, in the days of specialization, how many opera orchestras go play Tchaikovsky concerto? <laughs> Only maybe the Vienna Philharmonic and, yes. and the Met. Yeah. But these guys, they played everything. So let's listen.
how do we recognize the unique nature of this? Just listening to this excerpt from the first movement, to me, he, he completely adopts the ballet of that first movement. Um, most of us, I think today, we tend to play that in a more, much more bravura style, mm -hmm. um, and maybe thicker. The thing about his tone, while beautiful, is it's effortless, it's mm -hmm. laser-like. There's no fat to it. It's, it's completely focused on the center of the string. Um, all of the color is very subtle. Mm -hmm. And what I found, for example, in the first phrase, right after the, little, for the opening introduction, opening, yeah. it seems static, doesn't it? It seems slow. It's mm -hmm. holding and holding it, hold, hold it. And yet, we now know, those of us who are not familiar, the technique is easy. Yeah. It's just like grease lightning. So why does he hold it back? Oh. And then we'll talk about slides in yeah. a moment. Why does he hold it back? I believe because there's a balance to the introduction. Heifetz used to say, you never give anything away in the first mm -hmm. phrase. It's static. And he's like, well, go. But he doesn't let you go. Because after the ta da pa da but then that's mm -hmm. where the dance begins. That's where the ballet begins. So one of the things that I find really phenomenal about something like this is that if you only heard the first 25 seconds you might say wow you know world-class soloist confusing you know, what, what, is, what is he doing why is that he why sets up the introduction in such mm -hmm. a way that when he gives you the horsepower mm -hmm. it's cathartic and unpredictable just, right, right so and you said that let's talk about the slides so it was first impression the Probably, slides. Yeah, we, we looked at right. each yeah. other when right. we heard it's, the first It's the art of portamento. It's right. so right. vocal. Uh, the, you know, the, the way he goes like a Ita good Italian singer. And also he's uh, very, very detailed. Not only huge nerve when he goes after something like a raging bull, but also with a, such a multitude of different dynamics, yeah. almost resembling the voice when the word is influencing the voice. But in the same time, he has this boldness. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Well, let's come back to the portamento. Yes, so, right. the, 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 to me, uh, uh, you know, yeah. without getting into what would be acceptable today, mm -hmm. I think the reason he does it where he does it, and I, by the way, can tell you places where we do it, where he wouldn't mm -hmm. do it, mm -hmm. is because it cannot be disconnected. Yeah. It's legato. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then the question comes up, is there a different way to do it? Well, yeah. there is. There's two different ways to do it. Either you can stretch and kind of hide it, or you can use a different string. You go to a different string, you change the color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're going to strain it, maybe it doesn't have the same kind of vibrato. Again, I mean, there's no fat to that tone. Mm -hmm. So I think if you, if you can take the... Um, if you can... I would say this, let's suspend the distastefulness of our century because like I wouldn't play it that way. And let's listen to it for the connection, for the emotional connection yes. and for the vocal connection. Yeah. Because I think given what he's doing, he's basically saying, look, I'm unwilling to play non legato mm -hmm. just because it's easier mm -hmm. or maybe I don't want to slide here. Yeah. It's more important to connect and be vocal than anything else. So in other words here, for, uh, he's Priorities to serve the music and musical phrase first. Absolutely, uh, yeah. When technique becomes be? the secondary yeah, goal. Of course. It's it's just exactly it's just exactly like in singing. This is what it says. His violin resembles the art of singing, uh, the way he just uses this. Because with this kind of technique, he easily could do the second variant. But I think this is absolutely deliberate, because art for me. When I will be talking one day about this, the bel canto, which means beautiful singing, is the art of legato. Right. When you go with the perfect sonority from and to in a perfect legato, that is what the Italians consider to be bel canto, beautiful singing, and I think it's a bel canto on the violin. Absolutely. The other thing is also, I don't know whether he's using the del Gesù or one of the early strads from 1713 or the, the early strad, but it doesn't matter. The, there's no question that he plays with his instrument. Yeah. Not with the violin, but with yeah. his instrument. Yeah. Yeah. And that instrument is a great fit for him yeah. because it's not fat. Yeah. The overtones, you hear them all the time and they hang up in the air. Interesting enough, I mean, we can talk, this is maybe not the world's greatest recording. Mm -hmm. You know, we can clean it up, quote, 
we can sweeten it up. Don't want to, mm -hmm. because I want to hear the man, As not is. the engineer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's the beauty of life. Yes. Yeah. In a way, this is maybe the beauty of electronic recording because it's still electronic it's recording. For in Germany, the tape recording is only 1942, 1943 in Germany created. Which means he made a mistake, he has to re-record the entire thing. But on the other hand, you cannot manipulate and you re really hear the violinist Absolutely. in the moment. Absolutely. And that moment, in my opinion, is what they cherished the most. I think they had a good plan, they studied very well, but then they knew something will happen in the moment that might will alter the plan. They will follow the moment. Well, you know, the, the, without getting into the Glenn Gould idea of mm. studio recording, I think that day you still did not I mean basically this was new yeah this is weird this is an outside thing so the bottom line was they were performing and the idea of patches and takes and you know fixing from B to C mm. they would have thought it's just really a, a clinical antiseptic yes. and anti-musical yeah as you said if it if you don't like it I don't want to talk about why play the whole thing again yeah should we listen to the slow moves? Thank you. 
So in the canzonetta, um, which we all know is not the original slow movie, because Tchaikovsky wrote what is now known as Serenade Melancholique, and then yeah. he thought it was too long and too heavy for this concerto, and, and he went with the slow movements. I find the level of detail at the end of every phrase unique. You know, the little nachschlags, which are actually written out, are pretty much notated the same way. Not a single one does he do. And he points out leading tones, he points out, you know, intervals that are important to him. Mm -hmm. And rather than discuss, well, you know, why, I kind of like the idea that it's completely unique and very improvisatory. So for a piece of music that is really in some ways almost an intermezzo between this huge first movement and this virtuosic last one, it's just so clean and refreshing, and yet without any loss of detail. You know, it's very vocal, actually. It's, it, it's, uh, it's absolutely a yes, because oh, yeah. it's, a pure it's, an, it's 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 an aria. As and if I may add, what what comes into mind when people play like this is that it could be dressed in the word. Mm -hmm. It's like the words are sounding. It's almost as a singer sings, and the meaning of the word is coming. So this is some text which is known only to him, but we are receiving on some sort of the intermediate level that he's talking to us about something, but he doesn't want to appeal to our brain. He wants to omit it and to go directly under the skin into our heart. Can we meet him halfway in that beautiful, in, in, in this beautiful music? So he's talking to us. He's talking to us at the moment because I'm sure if he would play this concerto again, it would be slightly differently. And that's what I cherish in them. They never played uh, the, the same twice because next time is a unique time and they are in a different time and the timing is different. Yes, mm -hmm. You said uh, while we were listening that he's crying. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very lament. Yeah. Now, next one is uh, Kreutzer Sonata. Oh, something for pianists. Which is, which is, by the way, he plays with the great Ignaz Friedman we will talk about Ignaz Friedman. They they are from the same village. Right. They were yeah. born in the same year. In the <laughs> same year, and uh, near Krakow. Uh, Next um, series, we will just uh, take, take the uh, break uh, and we'll uh, talk about Friedman uh, separate. But yeah. I just wanted to mention, yeah. it's bad enough they were born the same year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They died one year apart. Yeah. It's like an old married couple. <laughs> 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 and then they play the Kreutzer Sonata. Oh, yes, but this is what, by the way, you are right now. Mm -hmm. You will find this portamenti in Beethoven's Sonata, too. How dare he to take a classic composer and to allow himself a portamenti, especially German composer. And I will tell to them, if you would have told Beethoven that he is classic, he probably would hit you with something heavy okay. because he considered himself a romantic because he said the music is about emotions then he considered himself a romantic composer. You know, when we're creating the cliche and the Mozart is to be played this way and Beethoven is to be played this way, this is when we begin to kill music. And why we uh, decided that you had three um, different periods of his uh, legacy, right? So well, we didn't decide it's, it's the historians. And historians the, say, know, yes, the, but the, the like, like Alexander said, yeah. it's Beethoven knew. <laughs> well, as, 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 my, as my old music history teacher used to say, it wasn't like Beethoven woke up one day in 1804 exactly. and said, oh, I'm in my middle period. Whoa. Oh, God, what a relief. <laughs> yes, and by 1915, middle age crisis. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, oh, it's yeah. Yeah. It's all about emotions. Uh, We're all human beings. Yes, and, and, and I think this is exactly how he interprets. Mm -hmm. It's emotions. It's a great sonata, absolutely, and uh, beautifully played by both. Let's listen uh, with Ignaz Friedman, who, as we mentioned, was born in the same village, and the same year, and died Friedman. one year after his good friend um, Huber Mann.
Christmas Sonata, of course, was dedicated to George Bridgetower, and the big story on it is that Beethoven had a big fight with him <laughs> on the morning of the premiere, and um, he de dedicated it to Rudolf Kreutzer, who never played it. Right. In this case, it's very interesting because I think we all agree the placement of the violinist and the pianist is a bit unfortunate. We get too much violin and not enough piano, though I, I think, you know, Friedman's playing it, you know. Yeah. And it's so easy, um, but interestingly enough, there is that the second the, the 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 second theme group, right, yeah. the chorale, which they basically play twice as slow. Uh, they, I, it doesn't mark it. There's a couple of interpretive things here which mm -hmm. we should discuss. Why yeah. this theme? Uh, well, I think because he adopts E minor here mm -hmm. as as a as a tragic key to mm -hmm. the A minor before. Yeah. I think I think he looks at it as a completely different thing because it's such a virtuosic and, and, and motoric movement yeah. that it's the only time you can kind of rest until the. Re oh, but but the like, what, what do you think? I mean, where does the Beethoven marking, which is clearly the same tempo, yeah. where is it that the interpretation takes over too much? I don't know. Uh, I can argue about this. That's what, about what do you think? Face. I think uh, um, if we we'll compare. Uh, this uh, performance with other very famous people like Mark Argerich and uh, Guillaume Kramer and Alejandro and Nicolas Aborin and um, Oistra, uh, recorded Oistra. even us. Oh, <laughs> Oistra, right. They are having completely different rhythm, completely different interpretations, so different from each other, and they are all convincing. Yeah. And uh, here, when I heard and we, when we recorded those sonatas, we, we really argued about this, I remember, and I was really against it because I am the advocate of the composer's uh, mark, mark mm -hmm. However, uh, it's acceptable. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's the, I think what happens, uh, we will jump a little bit to one pianist, mm -hmm. which we will speak about, of course, later, Svetoslav Richter, seventh, uh, eighth sonata, Pathetic. Mm -hmm. Da -dim -bum 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 -bum. It's not written, it's the same tempo. Yep. He plays it mm -hmm. twice as slow, but then gets off the hook in such a way that absolutely justifies. It's the burden of the person to prove to the listener. It's like you've listened to him playing Schubert, and you said, maybe it's not my favorite sonata, but you, I cannot stop listening. Yeah, stop listening. Uh, and that is that magnetism. In my opinion, all of the early composers beginning from Bach, I'm not going to go further than that. They were great improvisers. And I don't believe Beethoven everywhere would put everything as he basically knew that some of the episodes, he was very meticulous in certain places, and suddenly other places are left, maybe it's left for interpretation. Absolutely. And, and I think they kind of knew this because it was a live moment of sculpting the music. Again, he could play the sonata next time in a tempo you think is right. And can I tell you something? We have to remind people, right. yeah. this is 1801 still. Yeah. It's the last sonata that is 1812. Yeah. So, but <laughs> that might be an argument against what we're talking about yeah. because early period Beethoven, I mean, that's, 
kind of maybe more the evolution of Mozart mm-hmm. than the beginning of Schubert and you know Berlioz and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. where's the freedom? I agree with you. I think that that even in the Baroque, they would have said, look, you know, Corelli writes about this. Yeah. Like, if you can play the instrument, who am I to tell you how to play it? <laughs> Not only that. Speaking of Mozart, if you bro, if you brought Mozart. Mozart elaborated on the art of rubato, lamenting that this is, rubato, it means to steal the time and to return it, right? Yeah. Yes, that this is almost lost. Do you know how Mozart describes the art of rubato? Iron tempo and the rhythm in the left hand, and only God knows in the right, and they meet each other here, so and so. If you cannot do this, you don't know the art of rubato. Well, <laughs> well, uh, yeah. by, uh, by yeah. the way, but it's slightly different. But yeah. Maybe we'll talk about it later. I have Beethoven's Concerto with the Vienna and George and a young George. <laughs> And timing. Timing is everything. Is yeah. We know that. And uh, speaking of rubato, we can just talk about it more and more and more. But here, uh, you know, what came to my mind today, uh, if you would, you know, imagine a student using that uh, way of expressing oh. rubato, probably he would be. And in hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, but why is that? Well, I think it's because you have to learn how to use it. You know, um, it, it's like it's like using something that if you use it wrong, it'll kill you. But if you use it properly, it's the best thing ever. So in other words, your, it's your burden of proof. But Gary, can I ask you the question since you have, well, once you played all of these sonatas with okay. Bayer, right? You, you have a recording. I bought it. <laughs> all right, yeah. And so should you. And so should you. <laughs> all right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what would you uh, what would you think would be important for the modern violinists or in general musicians to learn from that, what we've heard right now? Because for me, I'm I'm learning every time I hear, every time I'm listening something new. But what what is missing today? Why Ivory Gitlis in that movie that we will suggest says that before the violinists, even on bad recordings, fingers followed the soul. Today, soul follows 
fingers. So why did he say it? And it's not only him, it's Horowitz, it's Byron Janis. In other words, American pianist, great American pianist, there are many, many musicians, he said that we somehow dehumanized ourselves in interpretation of music and we do not have any more that freedom. What do you think would be most well, important? Well, I think first and foremost, you have to allow yourself to be free on stage. And that can only be done if you're technically aware and capable. So, you know, you spoke about students. I think the student, provided they work hard and they have some talent, and I, I'm sorry, I mean, in order to play at this level, you have to have some talent. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> some people who don't have much talent, you know, they might get there, but it's pretty tough. Yeah. And if you believe in yourself and you really can do that, I think you must push yourself to make a statement. Yeah. And not be afraid. Not, you know, they say this about the great ones, they're fearless and you can hear it. Yeah. And it's smart to be fearless if you can back it up. It's dumb to be fearless if you can't back it up. Absolutely. If you don't so have you a... You do the work at home. Yeah. And on stage, you just let it go. Yeah. The other thing that these guys do, I think that we've kind of lost a little bit, is the ability not just to play different for difference's sake, but to listen to the room, to listen to your partner. Like, for example, I was thinking, technically speaking, his chords are rough. Mm -hmm. Musically speaking, they are the character, and mm -hmm. uh, Friedman mm -hmm. actually shortens his chords mm -hmm. and doesn't let it ring because he knows that it would cover and it wouldn't work. Then yeah. it just sounds like they're doing this. Yeah. So it's interesting observation. And, and, yes. and don't you think? I don't know if you guys agree. I'm sure if they were sitting here right now, and we said, "Well, did you realize that you shortened that because he said that?" He said, Hell no. Why would I do that? It's in the moment, yes. We yeah. played it, it was okay, and we went home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the point. In, they allowed themselves to be in the moment. Of course, they had the plan. They were very mid. Not only that, they would not listen to any recording before they got acquainted with the music themselves and formed their opinion. They just allowed the moment to slightly dictate the rules because. I am not the same day by day. One day I feel hoo hoo ha ha, the other day I'm a little bit sad and it will influence my Beethoven sonata or anything else and that is all okay. What is not okay, no matter how you feel, you're playing that safe variant that no one will object. And I object playing like this. And uh, what is the safety yeah. in this matter? What, what, what do you think? What, what, what's well, look, even the tempo changes, you know, we talked talk yeah, about... So you know, when, when he does that last, uh, uh, before the da da da, yeah. da when he does that, that, that scale, of, you know, and it's, people have actually criticized that passage, it's not mm -hmm. great Beethoven. I don't know, I think like the opening of the 770 is pretty great Beethoven, it's on one note. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think by pulling it back, which we don't do, and I don't, you know, I don't think it's great for us, but it works for him. Because he pulls it back because he doesn't allow you to go where you want to go. And mm -hmm. then when he does, it's like we talked about it in the Czech. I mean, it, it, you, it's cathartic. Absolutely. He t grabs you like you grab the kitten and carries you and drops you whenever he wants, right. not whenever you yeah. want. Yeah. But yeah. what is amazing, right before the finale mm -hmm. of, the, of the movement, he plays on purpose without any vibration. That's right. Almost as to sort of flatten everything down and then when explosion happens you are the victim right. in the good sense of its word well also don't forget I mean that's the prayer that is a corollary to the introduction yeah because the introduction could be a major yeah you know the, yeah. the whole idea is you don't know what key you're going with it and only the piano responds okay I got it yeah you know what I mean so and again and that's another thing I, you know you spoke about why I don't know that we teach enough the balance of the interpretation. Mm -hmm. We teach a lot about, oh, that sounds good, that doesn't sound good, this won't work, but that. Well, what about, what, did you do that here because you did that there? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that that get, gets taught a, a lot. Uh, no, quite in contrary. I, I absolutely agree. Toscanini was famous by conducting the slowest ring in Bayreuth and then the fastest. And when he was asked, he said, for the one, I had certain singers 
the tempo worked better for them. For the other, the other tempo worked, but when Toscanini would change one tempo, the, he was famous for this, for the form, for keeping the form. All other tempo underwent a certain change in order to create the whole scope of lines together. I absolutely agree with you. No, we're not teaching this now because that takes a risk. Yeah, but I, is it, are the performances worse off for it? I mean, God forbid you'd say, well, you know, what you like to do here, then make sure that the opposite is here, just so the whole thing is balanced, or yeah. do exactly the same way so they know. I'm afraid that some think some people don't think anybody knows. Yeah. That's what worries me most. Yeah. I think some people go like, you know, I got an hour, you know, and you can't play that in tune. So I'm going to talk about that instead. Yeah, yeah. yeah Beto so. Pichardo? Yes, 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 of course.
interesting mm-hmm. because it's Rococo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, considering the time that this was written, very actually close to the Kreutzer Sonata, I mean, it's fluent. It, it, you know, if it wasn't this kind of music, you would think it's almost CPE Bach. You know, I mean, yeah. it is just very simple, but it has tremendous detail and mostly in the tone. Yeah. The tone has a million colors. Oh, yes, that's the You know, and it doesn't actually point anything out to you. He just basically says, mm-hmm. well, here's the piece, you know, with a lot of scales and arpeggios, yeah. and just listen to me play it. But interesting, he, he was a pianist. Yeah, he played well. Major was a piano, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, he was first famous for his piano, then not. But this is genius, how well he knew the instrument. Yeah. Beethoven played violin and viola too. Yes, but still. It's what we were talking about. But it was, okay, but I mean, it's, yes, his, Mozart. Primary instrument was the piano. Mm -hmm. Favorite instrument was the viola and wrote best to the voice. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, you know. But he also could play a little bit Mozart on every instrument. Yeah. of the symphony orchestra. In Russia, we had only one person like this conductor, Nathan Rachlin, that one could take up, uh, you know, and play even the trumpet if necessary. What was that? He was a trumpet player, right? Uh, I don't know, really, but I just know that he could actually touch a little bit almost yeah. every instrument he knew. Sorry, uh, but we, we could No, it's great, but uh, yeah. I, I just think, I think, you know, when you mentioned, like, what did we learn from this Beethoven concerto? I think it'd be fair to say there's not a single soloist that plays it like this. Today. Yeah. Not a single one. So did we lose something? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I think that there's an evolution, but I think that this is, it sounds so fresh. Mm -hmm. It's like you never heard that piece before. Yeah, yeah. And I could point out certain things that are not in the score. Yeah. But overall, I mean, like when he finished that, 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 yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, he Mm -hmm. does that, that that first scale, and, and, you know, I think most of us would say, well, you know, it's abrupt. Mm -hmm. It's probably a little, Strange. In the end, I think we should focus on the overall effect and not necessarily on every single detail may, that may not be to our liking. Uh, absolutely. This is a good point. Overall impression. Yeah. What print is put into you, and if print is deep, he made the point. Yeah. He's a great musician. Yeah. It's, it's like when people talk about Schnabel. Yeah. And I, I have to talk about Schnabel in a yeah. while and talk. <laughs> yeah. You know, he played a lot of wrong notes in those yeah. Beethoven's not that yeah. they recorded. Yeah, I know all of them. Yeah. And he still sounds like Schnabel. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, you know. D- details are Details matter. Details as matter, long but they're coming next, together. The yeah. After yeah. you the observe the, yeah. the entire piece, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, bigger picture. How about some Brahms? Yes, ah. of course. Oh, because I actually never heard Brahms. All I oh, have. Oh, good. Yeah, you like yeah, it. yeah. There's two movements. The first and the last yeah. movement.
sonata is based on the regular leader. It's the rain sonata. Yeah. And I think the leader part is more important. And so we talked about slide. I'm almost certain that his position on some of the slides that are maybe not done today is because it's leader. Mm -hmm. And because you cannot disconnect something. Now, an interesting question might be, well, is there a different way to do it? To play legato and still not do that. And the answer is yes, but is it acceptable to him? Yeah. I don't know. Not with us anymore. But I mean, it's it's just so refreshing because there's just no makeup, no maquillage here. No, it's yeah. right. pure yeah. music. The first impression, how we perceive it after me personally, yeah. it's not always sweetened, you know, how yeah. people are just doing overwhelming uh, phrasing. So it's so simple. And yeah. the simplicity. Uh, because uh, it's it's uh, the tradition comes very much right. from. Schubert mm -hmm. and uh, you know almost like you're sitting with your legs towards the fire uh, from, the, from the fireplace and just the singing the, the the melody I also what I like uh, another thing you know my opinion about Brahms and my disagreement with what happens today when he plays Brahms as a romantic composer and only because Brahms is heavily influenced by classics only makes him better in a sense yeah. that it's a the form is much more precise, but the Brahm in, Brahms, in essence, is a romantic composer. And as a romantic composer, he plays him, right. and he says almost as he's talking, he's trying to say something. Again, it's not just about playing; it's not about music; it's about message, and message could be different day by day. This yeah. is what was so good. By uh, for, they took risks. Sometimes they didn't work, but when it did, it was good. <laughs> yeah. presents a major problem. Yeah. So Reagan leader, it's leader. Yes. But raindrops are by their very nature separated. Yeah. So I think it's a very interesting expression that he takes, it, the solution, if you will, that he takes, in that, you know, the piano plays the raindrops, and the violin has to kind of go in between. It's mm -hmm. not all legato. Mm -hmm. And he does allow it to breathe a little bit but not so much that it's non legato. Mm -hmm. He's sort of on two chairs between legato and non legato. Yeah. And then we were talking how the very first phrase, almost shockingly banal, yeah. in terms of his tone yeah. and approach. Very strange. I yeah. would say that it, it's not uninvolved, like right? And then suddenly followed. And then he sweetens it up. And then the same phrase repeated, rich. 
So you say it's not an accident. I guarantee it's yes. not an accident. Yeah. So what do you think? Like we talked in Tchaikovsky. What do you think he wanted to say? I think the opening is... I can't say what he... Uncertainty maybe. Or I don't know. I think, I think he's saving the beauty mm -hmm. of the movement maybe. until the second repetition. Maybe. Yes. So what, whatever it is, in my opinion, when you want to say something important, you cannot be always eloquent because importance supersedes eloquence and you're trying to find the word at the moment and maybe he would have done it differently in a different time uh, but I think I, uh, knowing that he's a master of his instrument this is none of this is an accident. You talk about Ivory and yeah. Ivory always spoke music and interpretation has yeah. to be like language. Yeah. Now when you're saying something important maybe the first time you go through it and then you re-emphasize. Well, mm -hmm. if it was the best you had the first time, mm -hmm. why would you re-emphasize? Isn't it yeah. good enough? Yes. So I think his position is, hey, I'm going to do it. And then with the second time I do it, go, oh yeah, that's the way you opened with it. Mm -hmm. And it has more impact. I think it's a very interesting way to approach mm -hmm. it. And, you know, when we talk about passing on the great tradition, mm -hmm. at least try it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. If it fails in your room, you know who knows your but mother. That's exactly that's yeah. <laughs> it's exactly what we're talking about. Right. When it doesn't work, well, it, it does work big time. But when it does, yeah. it works big time, and this is very memorable. Gili, a great Italian tenor, said, "I maybe can remember seven to ten performances where I could say everything worked." I think maybe for these seven or ten performances, I became Gili. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, we don't remember how many notes and what he did, but this aftertaste, that's what matters. Yeah. So you're just living with the, some feeling. Yes. Well, you know, this right. is not as a masterpiece of texture, yeah. as yeah. we know when we play. Right, I mean, but still, it's a, it's a character, it's a mood. Right, but I'm just saying that if you have the raindrops in the piano and the violinist doesn't do enough, What's the pianist going to do? More than <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> You know, this is it. <laughs> I, you know, this is on you. So, But one more point that you brought earlier. Both of you, life experience that they put in this. Which of life experiences at the moment you're actually talking? You select sometimes. Today reminds you something that happened to you 15 years ago. And you want to put it, you find out that the music of Beethoven or music of Brahms resembles you that thing. And you will try to put this. In, in other words, that very risk of not being the same all the time. And to take risks and sometimes failing. But when you fly high, you fly high. We call it artistry. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, want, I also think we should talk about key sonatas. Pieces yeah. in G major. Yeah. I mean, this opening is so passed around. Yeah. He wrote all three sonatas on like two non-dications. So yeah. Good time for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. G minor. G minor. Yeah. Last movement is in G minor. Mm -hmm. Now, I would argue, no, it's not about tragedy, mm -hmm. but it's serious. Yeah. And you can't kind of play around with this idea of long or short. I did not hate using that. I mean, is it really vocal or is it a different kind of leader? Mm -hmm. Is it maybe not a leader that is effortless? Maybe mm -hmm. you have to work for it. I just think, I love that they tried it this way and, and next time we play, we can try some things too. <laughs> well, I mean, in, in every leader, you have a moment that leader is more like recitativo, mm -hmm. it's more like speaking, or more so preceded by melody, when melody carries the word. But some, Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, uh, Brahms in his leader has some of the things that are obviously recitativo and, and maybe this is the point of recitativo and, and he had to select a certain method to deliver that recitativo. I don't know but uh, I admire the fact that he takes chances. Absolutely. And gives yeah. us a, a room mm, yeah. for own, you know, our own interpretation. Yeah. Uh, I'm just yeah. thinking the, 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 think the romances it. with viola, Brahms mm. romances. Yeah. Because it's viola, because it's a thicker string. Yeah. He actually has the soprano sing in a different tessitura. Yeah. You know, so why not try something like this when you know that the instrument, that the piano, is the raindrops? Why not try certain things where you can change the texture subtly? Yeah. Because you know the piano can't help. Yes. Yes. So I, I, agree. I, I think it's a fascinating and. So there is obviously the reason why he does it. Right. Yeah. 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 He was an intellectual. Yeah. In the best sense of the word. And yeah. A new philosophy. 
And, and the one thing I would like to say to, 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 to the listeners, that almost all of them had the multiple different educations, uh, philosophy, mathematics, spoke several languages, and all of that were condensed in their playing. Mm -hmm. All of their knowledge, intellect, heart, humanity, everything they were putting into the instrument. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion. I know we've enjoyed being together and speak about this wonderful and incredibly important person to human history, not just music history, yeah. Bronislav Huberman. And I hope that you come join us for many of these episodes as we speak about people like Saint-Saëns, about some of the things that are going on in the world that are musically oriented, and uh, most importantly, that we can be here as friends and invite you into our living room to join us. Yes, absolutely. So next time, we, what, what, what we're going to do? Saint-Saëns, right? It, yes, it was Saint-Saëns. Uh, oh, we decided the second con piano concerto, and that will be interesting. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, you played yes. this concerto, right? Yes, I did, and okay, several so times. Especially One of my favorite pieces. pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, and I hope you like uh, our evening. Uh, well, mm -hmm. we have wonderful wine, uh, but next time. Yeah. Too bad you cannot taste it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> new guests are welcome, yeah. and uh, until next time, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.